Welcome to today's chat about government tools for combating climate change. I'm Heather Horn. I'm the editor of New Republic's Climate Desk, Apocalypse Soon. I'm here with Kate Aronoff, uh, Ben Ehrenreich, and Mariana Mazzucato. I'm going to introduce them and then we'll get started. Um, Kate Aronoff is a staff writer at the New Republic's Apocalypse Soon Climate Desk. She is the co-editor of We Own the Future, the co-author of A Planet to Win, and the author of Overheated, which is out next month, I believe. Um, ben Ehrenreich is a freelance writer and a contributor to the New Republic. His most recent work, Desert Notebooks, A Roadmap for the End of Time, was listed as one of the best books of 2020 by the New York Times and several others. He's also the author of two novels, Ether and The Suitors, and one other book of nonfiction, The Way to the Spring, based on his reporting from the West Bank. Mariana Mazzucato is a professor in the economics of innovation and public value at the University College London, where she is the founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She is the author of three books, The Entrepreneurial State, The Value of Everything, and Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism, which as it happens is out in the US today. So pick up a copy. Um, all three of these writers have features in our April issue of the New Republic magazine. Um, you'll hear them talking about it today, but also if you're curious, I believe that our wonderful marketing director, Kim Blanchard, is putting the links to these feature pieces in the chat. So um, let's get going. Um, I think we'll start with the Biden inauguration, which is kind of the, the big moment hanging over um, our current mindset when it comes to thinking about how to approach climate change um, through government. So um, Ben, in your piece, you talked a lot about um, the inauguration and about this disconnect that it seems where everyone kind of breathes a sigh of relief um, as Biden comes into office. Um, but at the same time, this huge amount that has to happen in order for us to meet anything approaching livable targets for climate change. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Have we, um, have we gotten complacent? Oh, you're muted. Okay, um, you can hear me now. Um, yeah, I think it depends as it always does in these questions, who we mean by we, right? Um, and my impression in speaking to um, a whole bunch of climate activists in reporting this piece was that they were absolutely not getting complacent, um, that people were um, relieved and incredibly happy um, at the change of the mood in Washington, um, because, you know, after Trump, you know, uh, a hyena could be in the um, um, Oval Office and and doing more to to deal with climate change. Um, so I, I think looked at against the scope of the problem, um, the policies that Biden has put in place so far, the actions he's taken so far, um, seem tepid, cautious, um, inadequate. Um, looked at compared to anything Donald Trump did, and really, to be honest about it, anything, anything Barack Obama did, um, or anything any previous American president has done, um, they seem, um, you know, energetic, ambitious, et cetera, et cetera. So for the first time, there is a, a president of the United States um, who seems to be taking this problem very seriously. And I have to say um, that for most of the campaign, certainly in the beginning of the campaign, he did not seem to be taking it seriously. And it is is um, really credit to the strength of um, you know, many thousands of dedicated activists um, in this country who have made sure that he, um, that he made it a priority. And in the first couple of weeks, he, he really seemed to. We had two Wednesdays, the Wednesday of Inauguration Day itself and the following Wednesday, um, where it was just one executive action after another. Um, but one of the activists I spoke to at the time said, this is fantastic, but in order to deal with the scope of the problem, he needs to have this level of ambition every Wednesday for the next four years, and then the next four years after that, and the next four years after that. Um, so among activists, there was certainly no sense of complacency. There was a sense that we need to keep pushing. Um, and I think the, you know, the bigger issue, which I try to deal with in the piece, um, and the thing that makes me most uh, ill at ease to be um, gentle about it, is that 
the entire narrative of change um, that the Biden administration is dealing with, and that to be honest, that a lot of uh, climate advocacy groups are also dealing with, um, is this notion of a transition to a green economy um, that we can basically leave the dirty polluting fossil fuels behind and smoothly shift our economy. Perhaps there'll be some bumps along the road. We're gonna to have to retrain some workers, et cetera, et cetera, but we're gonna create lots of jobs and we're gonna have lots of great new jobs in solar and in wind, and we're gonna to continue to have a wonderful blooming growing economy, um, only it won't be destroying the planet. Um, and the problem is that there's nothing that suggests that this can actually happen that way. Um, and it's there's also, I think, a much deeper problem, which I'm sure we'll get into over the course of the next hour, um, that I don't believe there is any way, I, I think capitalism is fundamentally inimical to uh, living in any kind of harmonious relationship to the planet and with not just to the planet, with one another. Um, that you know, we have a system which regards the entire material world and all living things, including human beings, um, as exploitable resources. Um, and I don't think that there is any way to make that gentler. Um, and the problem we are facing is so extraordinary. Um, it is such a, a, an ontological problem, a problem of just, you know, um, for not only for humankind, but for thousands and thousands of other species on the planet, um, that we need, we need to be thinking about doing things very, very, very differently. Not just how can we tweak this, uh, this economy and, and build it slightly different so it's a little bit gentler. Um, but clearly over the last 200 years, um, humankind has taken a very wrong turn. Um, and we need to be devoting enormous amounts of creative energy. And when I say we now, I mean, not just the pundit class, but, but really everybody um, um, in order to figure out how to live differently with one another and with the planet. Great, that is a fantastic segue to what I was about to ask Mariana, as a matter of fact. Um, Mariana, one of the things that I found super interesting about your piece is that, you know, hearing from Ben about how much change needs to happen, we have to do something very, very differently. Your piece made it really clear that um, sort of it defined the scope of the problem by talking about just how messed up the market is now, just how much, and things people probably don't realize, how much of the, the money that the financial market generates goes back into the financial market, into real estate, not into innovation, not into any of the stuff that policymakers claim they want. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and sort of what, how, how, how the imbalances in the market now create the opportunity for big change if someone were to really proactively address it. Sure. <clears throat> And by the way, I never use the word the market. So I it's think- freedom. Freedom. No, well, Sorry? Freedom. Sorry, yes. Freedom. <laughs> anyway, so what I try to do often is just begin with first principles. And you know, the market is not the same thing as business. And the problem is we end up getting the market outcomes that are, um, uh, out, well, outcomes of how we govern all the different organizations in our economy, including government. So I fundamentally think that government is misgoverned in the sense that at best, and this sort of links with what Ben was saying, at best, it has been about fixing market failures. We actually have to wait for things to screw up before government even has a kind of, you know, a remit, you know, where's the market failure that will be fixed? And by definition, you will always be too little too late. We have a very problematic corporate governance structure um, in terms of, you know, maximizing shareholder value. Um, you know, uh, $4 trillion have been spent just on stock repurchases by the global 500 companies, S&P 500 companies to boost, you know, share prices, stock options and executive pay. And we have very problematic relationships, often parasitic relationships between these two actors, you know, government and business. The financial sector, which is kind of, let's just put it separate from the real economy, business community is also quite messed up. And exactly as you just said, something like 80% of global finance goes back to finance. So finance is financing finance. You know, finance, insurance, and real estate absorbs most of global finance. But even when it goes to the you know, real economy, obviously that's not enough if it's then just fostering this very unsustainable uh, uh, production and distribution chain. So I really think we need to begin there because then we have to look within our structures and, and look at a massive redesign. It's not about tinkering, as Ben was saying. This is about a revolution in governance and in relationships. And let me just focus a bit on the relationship issue. 
you know, what we're currently seeing is a variety. So this is where I would depart from Ben. You know, it's not about capitalism. There's lots of different ways of doing capitalism and we're doing it wrong, but there's some countries, you know, like Scandinavian countries, which we know have, you know, trade unions on the board, which of course is not enough to get your green economy, but that's a different form of capitalism. But even with COVID, what we've seen recently is that some countries have been much more radical in terms of even how these recovery funds under COVID are being given out. They're not just about handouts to save business. It's about transforming business. This is what President Macron uh, said. He said, we're not just going to help airlines and automobiles get out of this crisis. We're going to, you know, kind of force them to change. So they had to actually commit to reducing their carbon emissions in order to get one penny of the recovery fund. In Denmark and in Austria, similarly, they had to commit to stop using tax havens, right? You know, this isn't rocket science. These are relationships. And if we don't change the social contract, which is in every single procurement, subsidy, guarantee, you know, loan uh, that is given out, then we won't get that change. And even that is not enough. So I do agree with Ben, we need you know, even more than that, but even something as simple as making sure that government money does not go to problematic forms of corporate governance. You know, we need to kind of start with very concrete areas. And unless we do that, the whole concept, for example, of stakeholder capitalism and stakeholder value, this kind of mea culpa moment that a lot of businesses are going through saying, yes, we will stop just maximizing shares. If it doesn't go to the center of how all these different organizations are interacting and having the green economy and the sustainable uh, you know, uh, uh, economy as the goal, which then has to be in the design of everything else, then we simply won't get the change we need. Right, we are, we are getting to the question of rethinking fundamental assumptions very quickly, which um, was probably to be expected if uh, any of our attendees have, have read the pieces in question. Kate, um, I wanna see if you can pick up where Mariana left off because rethinking some of our fundamental assumptions about foreign policy and um, thinking about how we engage in various incentive structures throughout the world was kind of the subject of, of your piece. And I'm wondering whether you can chime in on sort of what, what the Biden administration currently, but also, you know, U.S. administrations going back decades, what they've been leaving on the table in terms of possible tools for addressing this. Yeah, I think it's probably sort of well known to people on this call that, that when, when people think of, of sort of foreign policy and climate, you think of the Paris Agreement, right? Hugely important diplomatic achievement um, to sort of coordinate how the world will bring down emissions to keep warming below two degrees or 1.5 degrees. And uh, that's such a small part of, of what's required, right? It doesn't matter if emissions are generated in West Texas or in Shenzhen uh, or in Berlin, you know, they all sort of end up in the same place and that's sort of hurting us collectively. So in a re very real sense, domestic policy is foreign policy uh, when it comes to climate. That's true in other ways too. Um, but, you know, I think in climate, it's particularly sort of um, apparent that, you know, these, these two things can't really be understood as separate, and yet uh, they they so often are, right? I, I think you know the the image that sticks out to me um, is sort of days after uh, Barack Obama sort of went to Paris and you know did a sort of press tour around again this very sort of remarkable achievement of the Paris Agreement. Came back and within the week signed uh, a, a bill which repealed the crude oil export ban, um, which allowed sort of American uh, fossil fuels to you know really flood. Um, flood the world. Uh, similarly, last year at the climate talks in Madrid, or in 2019, excuse me, um, there was a delegation of House members who, um, you know, came and sort of made a big show about the U.S. being committed to the Paris Agreement, no matter what Donald Trump says. Um, Nancy Pelosi flew back and, uh, you know, really sold the USMCA, um, which uh, did away with some of the more problematic elements of, of trade agreements. Um, but specifically made sure to enshrine um, a sort of uh, investor state dispute settlement system protecting uh, investor rights of fossil fuel uh, investments in Mexico. Um, and so, you know, these two things, as Naomi Klein has said, really move in sort of parallel tracks, right? And that, you know, we, we think about kind of bringing down emissions domestically and then the Paris Agreement and maybe a bit of, of aid or something like that. Um, but but the sort of bigger questions, which the US actually has a really powerful role to play in, um, tend to go on questions, things like, you know, bilateral trade agreements, um, you know, the, the IMF and World Bank, which again, the US can play an enormous role if it really wants to throw its weight around um, in, you know, everything from uh, getting behind sort of uh, 
extending SDRs uh, to the rest of the world to really relieve the sort of debt challenges that are uh, making any sort of energy transition basically impossible uh, for, for, for many parts of the world um, to, you know, really taking, taking aim at, at some of these, you know, investor protections that, that enshrine the rights of, uh, of, of, of fossil fuel companies, essentially. Um, you know, we're not thankfully party to some of the, the more egregious uh, trade agreements that do that. Um, which I've written about different points, um, but you know, they're just a whole range of tools that are being left on the table uh, in terms of how we, how we fight this crisis. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, in the piece, go into a very specific sort of realm of that um, and you know, don't try to sort of walk around the, the argument a little bit, but um, you know, looking at OPEC, right? The US is a major fuel exporter um, and we often don't sort of behave as such, right? We have this sort of strange identity as an importer and an exporter. Um, and are sort of reluctant to do the things that, you know, basically every other fossil fuel producing country on earth does, which we can get into in a little bit. But um, part of the sort of uh, drive of the piece is to think about, you know, fossil fuels as a diplomatic issue, right? And that we have, <laughs> there is this body, um, which is, is problematic and, you know, it's very complicated in many of its own ways, um, but that its role is to constrain fossil fuel production. And it's been doing that. Um, sort of more successfully than it has in years in, in the course of the pandemic. And there's just, you know, a whole other range of tools that the U.S. could really pick up and use um, and, and use well. And I think what we've seen so far, and I'll, I'll you know, maybe end with this, is that um, the Biden administration, I think, is, is sort of keeping that firewall up between domestic and foreign policy. So we've seen a lot of progress uh, on the domestic emissions reductions, sort of um, you know, there's news out yesterday about this $3 trillion commitment, which is not as, as much as we need, as Ben said, but is, is big, you know, especially in the context of um, sort of spending debates a decade ago. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still uh, the sense that the sort of foreign policy team of the State Department is really doing its own thing, right? And it's, it's, it's you know, going abroad and, and sort of talking very hawkish language about China and, and, you know, kind of saber rattling about various things, um, which, you know, maybe we can get into a bit later, but I think the, the sort of bridge has not been built yet totally between the foreign policy establishment and a domestic sort of policy team, which is, you know, doing things that I think a lot of us would, found, would have found surprising for Joe Biden, uh, a Biden administration to be doing, uh, certainly during the primary last year. That brings us to, I think, the question of, of scale of change needed. I think that all three of you touched on that at different points. And it's funny, I was going to get a prompt to get you all talking about, you know, scale of change needed capitalism, how do we feel about it? But ironically, as you were talking, someone asked almost exactly that question and it's um, phrased more pointedly than I was gonna phrase it. So let, let's do it. I mean, usually we wouldn't switch to questions this quickly, but this was um, very on topic. Um, uh, an attendee, uh, Norbert, asked, if we need the end of capitalism or even radical restructuring to save the planet, aren't we uh, screwed? I'll modify that slightly. Um, and I think it's an interesting question for all three of you, because I think all of you think that we need pretty, pretty radical restructuring, but maybe in different ways. And the question of what is reform versus what is rejecting capitalism is a really, really interesting one. Um, so I don't know, do you want to just go... Um, alphabetically and start with start with Kate and then sort of you know people feel feel free to jump in if you have things to add. Uh, sure yeah I can start. Um, yeah I mean I, I have I've written a book called um, Capitalism Broke the Planet so I think I uh, you know have have sort of um, documented thoughts on this but uh, I, you know what I would say and I, I hear this you know from from a lot of my friends on the left is that I don't think we're going to dismantle capitalism in time to save the planet, right? I don't think we're going to sort of dismantle a centuries old system of production and build up a worker and alternative in the time we need uh, to be scaling up renewable energy, electrifying everything, uh, dismantling the fossil fuel infrastructure. You know, so I don't think um, we, we have that luxury, right? As what, you know, I'm a socialist, I think I would <laughs> love to see a sort of, um, you know, post-capitalist alternative to the climate crisis, but um, I think the reality is that, you know, capitalist productive systems are going to be a driver of this transition, right? Um, there are people who are going to make money on building solar panels and electric vehicles and things like that. And uh, I think that's just sort of a fact of, of where we are. I think the thing that has to 
change, right? And I think, you know, on the road to what I would hope to be um, a replacement of, of, of capitalism ultimately um, is to sort of displace it as a kind of organizing principle of society, right? Capitalism is many things, um, but I think it's a belief system. And I think that there are real, there are pieces of that belief system which need to be um, really dismantled. I mean, we see it in things like, um, you know, patent law, for instance, right? Where uh, the, uh, you know, sort of trying to dominate export markets for renewable energy as some of the rhetoric, I think from the Biden administration has, um, has expressed the desire to, um, will make uh, scaling out renewable energy in many parts of the world really hard, right? If they're charging, allowed to charge sort of extortionary rents on um, technology which develop, is developed here that we all need, um, that's going to make it very tough, <laughs> right? To get this, get this all out. Um, and so I think there are real ways that um, a, a climate response needs to pose a challenge to many of the things that you know, we would call capitalism. I don't think, yeah, I don't think we're gonna replace it in, in time to solve the challenge. Um, but I think that it, we will not solve this crisis without um, really questioning some of those, the very cores of that, of that belief system and building something that I think, you know, in, in 15 years, we may not recognize as, as the capitalism we know today. Yeah, I, I, I would um, echo Kate. I, I think, uh, you know, we're on track at the moment to hit 1.5 degrees of warming by about roughly 2030. Um, probably on the current trajectory, we'll hit two degrees of warming around mid-century, if not before. Um, so the dictatorship of the proletariat probably will not be arriving in ideal form um, before 2030, and we got shit to do. Um, and what this, I think, means to me is that um, as a movement, um, it's important to keep capitalism front and center. Um, and there's a million decisions that, that will have to be made by governments, um, by, by grassroots activists, et cetera, um, over the next 10 years, over the next 15 years, over the next 20 years. Um, and keeping um, a broader perspective is going to make a huge difference. You know, if we allow the Biden administration to deal with this by throwing huge amount of, um, of capital towards large you know, corporations and private utilities, um, towards you know, um, giving tons of money to build uh, you know, private cars, electric cars, et cetera, et cetera, and no money to, um, to build mass transit, for instance, um, giving tons of money to uh, big utilities to build giant fields of, of uh, you know, solar panels and not giving any money to communities to put solar panels on people's roofs and build rooftop solar and, and to create some possibility of, of energy democracy and uh, for, for communities. Um, so I think these are things we need to keep front and center constantly. And the other thing, and I think this is hugely important and, and entirely overlooked um, in a lot of the ways that climate um, advocates approach this problem, and part of this is because they, like, you know, NGOs have to raise money from rich people, um, is that, you know, the many of um, the problems that we as a society have been dealing with in many different forms, whether it's housing inequality, um, environmental injustice, um, our collapsing healthcare system, et cetera, et cetera, these are not separate problems uh, from the climate problem. Um, the richest 1%, this is from an Oxfam study, um, on the planet produce 100 times more emissions than the poorest 50%. Um, and this is uh, from the UN's environment program. Um, we could reach 1.5 degrees, um, we could stay within 1.5 degrees of warming if the richest 1% reduced their emissions by a factor of 30, which would allow the, the poorest 50% of the planet's population um, to increase um, their emissions by up to three times. Um, so inequality is the problem. Capitalism is very much the, the problem. Um, and dealing with these, uh, correcting these inequalities is, is absolutely vital if we're gonna uh, be taking on this crisis in any meaningful way at all. Teeing up Mariana there, I suspect you have thoughts. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I'm an academic, but I think uh, unlike many academics, a lot of my, uh, time is actually spent working with policymakers globally, trying to not just tell them great ideas, but help them make it happen. So, you know, to me, and don't, I don't mean this to sound rude, <laughs> but, you know, having this capitalism debate is like just not 
the point right now, right? I mean, as you both have just said, we need to uh, radically in a revolutionary way make the current situation change in order to even have a planet to live on, you know, in 10 years, basically, if you read the IPCC report. So, I mean, for me, it's very much about, first of all, at the high level, bringing this whole concept of, um, of what we're talking about, fighting global warming at the center of how we think about the economy. Currently, when interesting things happen, they happen on the periphery. They happen maybe at best, if they happen, in the Department of Energy and Sustainable Growth or something. It has to happen inside the treasury, right? I mean, that's my experience. Countries, when they start to get serious, it's when it's at the center, not at the periphery of the conversation. And that means completely changing about how we think of the economy, how we think of debt and deficits, outcomes-based budgeting, instead of saying, oh, how much money do we have? What can we do with it? You start with what has to be done <laughs> and then backtrack and look at how you know, everything you do has to change. And that's why in my new um, book that's out today, yes, thank you, <laughs> uh, called Mission Economy, I kind of you know, go back to the moon landing and say, you know, had they done a net present value or a cost benefit you know, calculation about whether it was the right thing to do, they would have never begun, right? It was very clear, you know, the big challenge was beat the Russians, Sputnik. The mission though was very, very concrete, getting to the moon and back again in one generation. They had leadership. I'm not saying it's perfect. There was a lot of other things going on at the time, including civil rights movement. But, you know, Kennedy said very explicitly, we're gonna do this because it's hard, not because it's easy. It's gonna cost us a huge amount of money. We're probably gonna fail along the way as they did, you know, think of what happened with Apollo 1 disaster, but it's worth it, right? And unfortunately, we only think things are worth it when it really comes down to like something urgent, like fighting a war, or in that case, beating the Russians. And instead, so much of what we should be doing radically right now is that continuous change, you know, seeing global warming as urgent, seeing it, it's just as urgent as, you know, a, a kind of a wartime scenario, but it's not enough to come in late you know, like we did now with COVID, where all of a sudden, again, we're saying we have to do whatever it takes. Yeah, but guess what? You've just underfinanced your health system for 20 years. It's, it's very hard to beat a health pandemic with such weak global health systems. Similarly with climate, we can't actually wait until we have a climate lockdown, which there will be one. You know, we still have the option to do things differently very soon, very soon. We won't, right? So what do you need to do in the everyday to think differently and one of the things I found so interesting with the moon landing is they really cared about those kind of things I mentioned before, right? When NASA was working alongside business, they actually took time to put things like no excess profits <laughs> in the clauses of the procurement contracts. No one talks about this. You know, don't make what we do now space a gambling casino with Elon Musk making you know, billions on the back of a public infrastructure, NASA and other uh, uh, global public uh, infrastructures out there in space. It was, we're going to do this together, right? It's government-led, really clear goal. Of course, business has to be part of the solution, but the procurement contracts were then designed really, really carefully to foster what they cared about, which I'm kind of putting words in their mouth, but is a symbiotic, not a parasitic, you know, uh, ecosystem. So they were clear what the target was, and then they designed the procurement contracts that would really catalyze as much innovation within the private sector. And there was lots of that in nutrition, materials, textiles, the whole software industry came as a result of that, but they weren't taken for a ride, right? And it wasn't just slogans about, oh, we're gonna you know, do this and that. It was very much designed into the system. Um, now, one of the things though, with today's moonshots, you know, if, if we can call it that, if you take all the sustainable development goals, including the climate related ones, and there's at least three climate related ones and turn them into missions, you know, the first thing, and, and I think this is what Ben was getting at, it can't be a top-down process. One of the first things is we need much more citizen engagement and buy-in, even when we talk about things like, you know, a carbon neutral city, which can be a very clear, you know, moonshot. We need citizens to be part of that design, that co-creation, that contestation. And one of the things I learned with the Brexit debacle, and it was a debacle, unfortunately, no one's talking about it anymore because of COVID, but we're living through this massive kind of economic meltdown from it was that citizen assemblies came up a lot in the UK in terms of places where people were debating and, you know, not agreeing, but still debating about, you know, um, this, this issue. And, and I just think that on the one hand, we need that government leadership. We need that, you know, bottom up experimentation by all sorts of different actors like we had with the moon landing, but we need something the moon landing didn't have, which is that co-creation and co-design bit of it. And, you know, in Sweden, for example, What's interesting is they have a very high level government mission, which is a fossil free welfare state. 
which means that everything the government does from public education, public transport, and public health has carbon neutral kind of targets to it, to the point that they've landed it down even on things like school meals, which as you know, with COVID has become a big issue because many kids, that's their only healthy meal during the day. And when they were in lockdown, they weren't getting it. But what if you had sustainable school meals, healthy, tasty, and sustainable school meals? And what about bringing kids into that process of designing, right? You know, the sustainable school meal and also being monitors along the way when it's not working, because if, it, if it's not tasty, they're not going to eat it. So I know that's sort of a microcosm, but I think we have to begin with, you know, changing really concrete things, learning how to do it differently, and then scaling it up across the board. And if we just talk about capitalism, if it's good or bad, we're, we're just not going to get to that nitty gritty, which I think is what's missing right now. So you, you bring up um, the issue of mission driven uh, economic management and you specifically mentioned like sort of the uh, the moon landing as an example of that. And you, you did also mention, however, um, the possibility of like a war mobilization. And that's like the, the comparison point that everybody brings up on this topic just constantly. Um, I think it actually came up in the presidential uh, debate uh, in the fall. And one of our viewers just asked about this. What do you think of the World War II comparison? Like is wartime mobilization the right analogy for this? And this is, you know, I'm starting on Mariana, but honestly, like I know um, all three of you have had thoughts about this. Um, so yeah. What do you think about the World War II analogy? Well, one really interesting thing about World War II um, that my, my friend and colleague Damon Silvers um, taught me about, so he's the head of policy for the AFL-CIO, was that the massive transformation of, of for example, the automobile in industry into a wartime industry um, happened, first of all, very quickly, within six months, quicker than what we've seen with COVID, where we still are not getting personal protection equipment to frontline workers in many parts of the world, we call them essential workers and underpay them and don't get them you know, the, what they need on the front line. Um, but also that it wouldn't have happened without trade unions. You know, so coming back to this issue, this issue of real stakeholder value, so it's not just you know, government and business, but also social movements, and in particular, the trade union movement, which in World War II was very important, that kind of negotiation, you know, also coming back to my earlier point about you know, going beyond just a top-down dictate, but getting you know, some level of consensus, that wouldn't have happened without the labor movement in World War II. And I think that's something that we often don't talk about with, uh, with the climate issue. At best, we talk about things like the just transition, right? which means that as you do move industries, which has to be every industry, into a sustainable path, there will be some industries that just almost disappear. And what does it mean to you know, actually be investing in the workers that they can tra transition towards these uh, uh, new sectors and um, et cetera. That's very important, but we also need those voices, let's just call it labor's voices at the table ex ante, not just ex post, making sure it's fair. And I think it's just interesting how missing that is right now from the climate debate. You know. Uh, ben already talked about, you know, that this isn't just about climate justice, but also racial justice, labor justice. Well, it's, you know, justice sometimes can get interpreted as just an ex post thing as making sure something is fair, but the real justice is making sure that there's that kind of pre-distributive <laughs> uh, justice, which is whose voice is even being heard, who's, who's you know, who's even, um, how do you say, whose voice is being heard when we talk about sustainability or again, carbon neutrality and the green transition. And, um, but the other quick thing is, you know, what we're hearing again with COVID, which is we have to do whatever it takes, you know, money literally coming out of the woodwork. That's always the case in wartime. Have you ever heard a government, any government say, oh, we can't go to Afghanistan. Oh, sorry, we can't go to Iraq or Iran or can't fight World War II because there's no money. They find the money when it's wartime, right? And they also find the money last minute in a health pandemic like this where, you know, millions of people are dying. Well, that's too late. <laughs> Right, so how do we really take on this idea of outcomes-based budgeting or admitting that money is created, a government budget is not the same thing as a household budget, right? Um, in the normal way of thinking. And so it has to begin with what are our priorities? Where are our priorities? The digital divide has to be a priority. Strengthening our health systems and the welfare state and reimagining the welfare state must be a priority. Otherwise we get you know, health pandemics. Um, um, and climate change is the number one, you know, global warming has to be stopping, it has to be the number one priority and then building backwards on what that means for money creation, but also forms of financing and the kind of structures on the ground. And um, yeah, so that's, 
it's not so much World War II, is how do you treat you know, global warming like a war, <laughs> but just make sure you don't just fight it last minute when it's too late, but along the way. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I'm always a little nervous about war metaphors and specifically, you know, World War II metaphors, which uh, have been put to a lot of ill use in this country and elsewhere around the world. Um, but I'm probably more comfortable with them than I am with, with the moonshot <laughs> metaphor. Um, and keep thinking of the, uh, you know, the immortal Gil Scott Heron, uh, you know, um, uh, landlord raised the rent again and Whitey's on the moon. Um, and I know Mariana, um, you know, of my book. <laughs> uh, excellent. Uh, alludes in, you know, in, in her piece to, uh, um, to the, to the, you know, the moon mission happening while there were all these other problems happening. But I think, I think the thing that makes me nervous about it is it not just that it's this, um, cold war project, um, right. Which is to say that it was a, an imperialist project. Right. Um, and, but that it was also, and essentially like colonial project, we are settling. There was nowhere, there was nowhere left on the planet. Everything was taken up between the first and the second world, right? Um, between the US and the Russians. So we were gonna get to the moon first. Um, and I think that, that way of um, understanding um, not just the earth, but the entire cosmos as something that needs to be conquered, um, as resources that need to be claimed, um, is actually the entire problem. I mean, th this, is, this is actually uh, what got us here, is regarding um, the natural world and people in it um, as, you know, um, as resources that can be exploited. And, uh, you know, I think, it's important to say that this is not a question of just talking about capitalism. This is not um, an um, academic debate for certainly for me and I think for um, a lot of people that want to have this argument. Um, but the fact is that as long as we're not talking about capitalism, then we're stuck within a paradigm which traps us. Um, you know, we're, as long as we're still imagining that we can chase after growth and continue to have um, the kind of GDP growth that, we, that we've had um, over the last 50 years, um, but do it, uh, you know, with a, uh, a green economy, with, you know, with solar, with wind, et cetera, et cetera, um, then we're not facing the problem at all, which is whether you can't actually do that. There is no evidence at all that you can actually do that. The, the, you know, the entire language of decoupling, um, the entire sort of fantasy beneath green growth that we can decouple our economy from its basis in fossil fuel and move it to something else and have the smooth transition it, it's just not going to happen there's no evidence this has happened anywhere um, and there's a series of delusions on which most um, of the kind of basic assumptions of how we go about thinking about um, dealing with climate change are based that if we don't deal with them, we, we, we're not gonna, we have no chance whatsoever except to march on into the abyss. Um, and if we're going to avoid marching on into the abyss, then we have to think much more seriously about how we relate in really fundamental ways to one another into the national world. And I noticed Mariana, you know, has, has referred to Scandinavia, has referred to France, has referred to Denmark, has referred to um, Austria, both in terms of, of COVID and, and in terms of um, climate change. All of these countries are countries that have, that have done fairly abysmally um, over the last year during COVID. Um, and if we want to look at the countries that have actually done well, um, they are countries with socialist legacies. Um, and you know, Vietnam, Cuba, nobody likes to talk about Cuba very much, but Cuba's done extraordinarily well at dealing with this pandemic. Um, the Indian state of Kerala is the only part of India that's dealt well with this, uh, which has had a communist government for years. Um, so th th this is not academic um, for, for people on the ground. It's not academic for people dealing with these struggles. Um, it's not academic in terms of any of these fights. It may be academic if we're only talking about um, the existing heads of state um, and policymakers in European countries um, and the business leaders that they deal with. Um, but for the rest of us living on this planet, this is absolutely essential. I'll just um, chime in on, on kind of World War II. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's instructive um, for a lot of reasons. You know, I think uh, there's economist J.W. Mason, who's, who's done good work on this as an economic historian. Um, Andrew Bossy, I think, um, and just looking at the sort of incredible things that the U.S. government managed to do in such a 
short period of time, right? Creating virtually whole supply chains for things like synthetic rubber from scratch, you know? Um, but I think it, you know, sort of like Mariana was saying, it gets the, the sort of prehistory that gets left out, which is uh, the, the New Deal, right? The New Deal sort of empowered workers uh, in a way that the US government had never done before and sort of built a coalition which could sustain, uh, you know, sustain the war mobilization in very material ways. Uh, and, you know, I think, not thinking of a sort of New Deal order in a, in a bigger sense kind of obscures how we think about um, what, what, the, what the war mobilization did, which again, I think they're you know, amazing lessons to draw from uh, in terms of just what we have to do for the climate crisis. But the other way that I, um, that, that I, I sort of you know, see the, um, uh, the, the war of mobilization talked about and you know, people talk about the kind of post-war era, like the 50s is sort of like golden age of, of capitalism supposedly is to say that you know there's a time where things felt better right that you know which i think should should just go without saying that was not a better time for you know many people in this country particularly people of color um you know we were not living in a democracy at that time um but uh it, it you know there were well-paid jobs people could sort of make ends meet could go to college um you know some people certainly right um and I think what made people feel good, you know, wasn't necessarily something sort of magical about industrial production, right? It wasn't sort of a um, magical factor about manufacturing and, and export markets and things like that. There were unions, right? <laughs> like there were unions that fought for those jobs to be really good jobs. Um, and part of the worry that I see, I think, in, in domestic policy is that, um, you know, we like think that manufacturing has a sort of special quality that's going to, you know, make our lives so much better where, you know, we, we need good jobs. And the fact is, I don't think the U.S. is going to be a pri primarily manufacturing economy anytime soon, right? You know, we have a, a service economy and we have, um, you know, a care sector, which needs to be greatly expanded, as we've seen from the pandemic. You know, we've been underinvesting in hospitals and healthcare workers in work primarily done by women and people of color. Um, and building that, you know, care sector is, is essential and isn't thought of, you know, in the same way we think about infrastructure in the way that we think about, um, you know, manufacturing as being the core to a sort of good, quote unquote, middle class existence. Um, but it's absolutely, I think, part of the future. And I think this, this kind of gets to what, what Ben was talking about, about a bit, which is that we need to do something that's fundamentally new. And I think there's good lessons to draw from the New Deal, from World War II, um, you know, from the last hundred years, but ultimately we don't know how to do this, right? We've never transitioned off of the energy, you know, the energetic basis of, of capitalism before, right? We've never done that. Um, and I think we need to, you know, have a sort of kind of humble approach to thinking about what that looks like. It means transforming the welfare state, you know, their whole regional economies um, just in the US are going to be devastated as if, you know, if we transition off of fossil fuels, right? And so that's not a matter of retraining workers or sort of narrow just transition programs. That means doing the sorts of, you know, the, the few case studies we have of transitions going well, um, generally are people, you know, investing heavily in the care sector and investing, you know, in the jobs that sort of fill in the gaps when industries close, right? It's nursing, it's teaching, it's people's bodies have been broken by extractive systems, right? By, you know, coal mining. Um, and the work that cares for those people is just so underpaid um, and I think is, is neglected, right? You know, and the tax bases that are going to disappear um, as, as oil jobs sort of dry up, right? I think that the sort of gravity of, of what it means to get off of fossil fuels is not, um, I think, always appreciated. It presents a new challenge. And, you know, I think, um, again, you know, I think history can be sort of instructive in, in, in some of those ways. But part of what I take from kind of the legacy of, um, you know, presidents like FDR, flawed as they were, is that they, you know, and movements sort of helped them along in this thinking and, and movements were, you know, driving this thinking, I think, um, but really did something we hadn't done before, right? We had never sort of built a welfare state in the US at the start of the New Deal, right? And, and that's the challenge we face today. And I think the historical narratives can, you know, again, be helpful, but I don't think help us, you know, are, are in a blueprint, right, for what we what we have to do now, which again, I think is something that, you know, is, is a massive, massive challenge. And, and I think, you know, we're fooling ourselves a little if we, we think we have all the answers to it um, and not you know, pursuing what you know FDR called the spirit of bold persistent experimentation which I think Mariana references in the piece um, even that you know we we don't know how to do this right we don't know how to do it we need to like invest in figuring out um, how to get people to, to know how to do this and we know the sort of way to get started um, but it's a massive massive task and I, I, I just think you know 
Ben's piece was, was so sort of helpful for pointing out that um, we, we, we need other examples and other historical examples too, and other, other examples from you know, places like Kerala and um, the, the folks who have, who have navigated this, um, you know, this past year more successfully um, than we have. Can I come in and just um, develop also a point that Ben was raising? Um, sorry, Ben, when I was talking over you, I was just saying uh, that I had to pay $200 uh, <laughs> to put in Whitey on the Moon, which is a great, uh, great piece by Gil Scott Heron in the book. That was interesting. But also, you know, my, uh, my colleague, um, Dick Nelson, wrote a book back in 1977 called uh, The Moon in the Ghetto. You know, uh, how, how can we get... <laughs> people on the moon and yet still have this deep structural inequality on earth. And, and, and the answer is we just haven't actually, well, two things. One is we haven't treated these problems on earth with the equal level of you know, urgency, but also that they're much harder. They're actually much harder. We need all sorts of political regulatory behavioral change for lots of the problems we're talking about. It's not purely a technological you know, mission like getting to the moon. But your point on you know, Vietnam and Kerala, we actually have a report coming out with UNDP looking precisely at your point, which is you know, actually countries did really badly and some countries did quite well and they're not the ones you would have thought in, in terms of also just where they are in their developmental trajectory. The UK did terribly. We uh, outsourced our whole private uh, public sector in the last half century uh, to uh, the private sector. And we even outsourced test and trace uh, during COVID to Deloitte. You know, don't ask me who, who thought that was going to be a good idea. But interestingly, the vaccine rollout, which has instead been quite successful, has been really nested within our public health system. The UK does have a public health system, unlike the US. Obamacare is not a public health you know, care. It's, it's at best a, a, an insurance program and, and not one that, that's working uh, yet completely. Um, but, um, you know, and that was rolled out at the community level with GP practices where there was also kind of real trust on the ground. But what happened in Vietnam, I think we have to be careful. It wasn't successful because it was an ex-socialist country or a socialist country. It was successful because they have been in a really rigorous way over the last decades been investing a lot actually in their public administration, literally the, the public administration. I mean, that's what they call it. It's not just like the state, right? I mean, they really have what, what we call dynamic capabilities within the public sector, um, Kerala as well. And Vietnam's successful response was in, in, in very much actually, you know, uh, uh, on, on the back of having not just in, being investing within the state, but also precisely in those kind of relationships between academia, the state and government, which they have used also with previous crises that they've had to get things done on the ground. Um, but in this particular case, they strategically also used health R&D and procurement and really spent a lot of time, again, designing the procurement practice in order for it to um, get enough you know, PPE and, and test kits on the ground. And that's not true of other ex-socialist countries. So I think, I mean, this is what I meant in the beginning when I said it's, it's you know, let's kind of get real. It's not about capitalism versus socialism. There's different ways of doing capitalism. There's different ways of doing socialism. And if we look at ex-socialist countries, ones that still have history, you know, like a memory of what it was like, they, a, a lot of them have done it badly. So what really matters is what have countries been doing over the last decades in order to make sure that A, the government itself believes that it can do more than just fixed markets and has been investing within its own organizations, including, but not only the health system, the remit of government itself, not there just to fix the problems that the private sector creates, but actively co-create and co-shape a better form of economy. Um, and also strong conditions attached. So the whole relationship with business, and, and, and this is the, I mean, the reason I talked about the moon landing was not because I think we should be thinking of, you know, moon landings or Mars ma you know, landings or, or big projects in the desert, but that when we did something that hard, it required leadership, it required risk-taking within government, explicit risk-taking, you know, admitting that we might fail today, any sort of failure in government's on the front page of the, here it's the Daily Mail. So you have, you know, civil servants not being uh, encouraged to take risks. Um, a very problematic public-private partnerships. You know, when, when I use the word, that's, that's a strong word, parasitic partnership, what I mean is precisely looking at places like the US, but not only where you have $40 billion a year being spent by the government on drug innovation through the National Institutes of Health. And yet then, you know, we somehow forget to make sure that the prices of the drugs reflect that. We forget to govern the intellectual property rights, which Kate was also talking about in a way that really reflects the fact that a patent is a contract between the state and the private sector. You're getting a 20 year monopoly 
monopoly profits for 20 years are not bad. That's what a patent gives you. But then what the state should be getting is that when the patent is up, you get full diffusion of that knowledge. But if in the meantime, you've allowed you know, patents to be too wide, used for strategic reasons, too, too, too strong, so hard to license, too upstream, so we're actually patenting and privatizing the tools for research, that's a really bad deal, right? So you know, we need to get our hands dirty on getting you know, better deals, symbiotic, mutualistic deals, and it is possible. Um, we see it's possible. In some cases, it's been done. And so I think just bringing it always back to socialism versus capitalism, and, and I am on the same side, obviously, of both you and, and Kate when we talk about you know, which system perhaps we think is the best one, but that doesn't get us the actual design changes that we need. It just makes it seem like it's, you know, it's all kind of bad or we need to look at the social ex-socialist countries to yeah no, I, I think the the point that I was making in the piece um, which I hope I'm, I've made clear today is is not we need to um, throw these words around capitalism and socialism which uh, is is not a very interesting exercise um, but that we need to rethink everything um, we are facing down such an enormous crisis that every aspects of our lives and and, and from the, from the largest structural ones, which means the economy, which is a capitalist economy, um, to the most immediate relationships within our workplaces, um, within our homes, our relationship to, to healthcare, to education, to housing, all of these things, to transportation. Um, there is no one of these things um, which does not ultimately relate to how we produce emissions. Um, and, and, and similarly with, with, foreign, with foreign policy. And, you know, I think actually the, um, the question of the vaccines is an interesting one, right? Because countries like the US and the UK, uh, which have some of the sort of most advanced neoliberal economies in the world, um, proved to be absolute disasters in terms of caring for their citizenry, um, just as they have been pretty disastrous in terms of dealing with climate change. Both of them did extremely well, though. Um, one of them that does have a um, public health system and the other one that does not, um, in terms of coming up with vaccines and making deals with vaccine makers, with, with the pharmaceutical companies. And they did that basically by being by working with the pharmaceutical companies from the beginning and throwing lots of money at them with no conditions, um, which produces the situation which Mariana has mentioned, um, which is they have these exclusive patent rights, they're not going to share them, um, which leaves this absolutely unconscionable situation um, where now people in the US are, are starting to go back to some semblance of normal life. Um, and much of the world is has absolutely no hope of getting a vaccine, right? The vast majority of the world's population um, vaccines are completely unaffordable because these pharmaceutical companies are sitting on these patents and are not going to share them. And the governments of the US and the UK have been totally cool with that, right? Um, and, and I think this is a good way of maybe getting back to um, something that we, we left off from the, the, you know, Kate's piece was about, which is the inseparability of um, an internationalist politics when you're dealing with something like a global pan pandemic or with climate change um, and, and, and these apparently domestic um, problems, um, that you can't beat back a global pandemic with a nationalist politics, with a nationalist approach to vaccines. And the same um, is, is obviously true and when we're dealing with global emissions, um, with, with, with carbon emissions, that, you know, um, which are heating the climate no matter where they're from. Um, and so I hope we can, we can, we know we're getting short on time, but I hope we can get to talk a little bit more about some of the things that, um, that, that Kate was dealing with. And I mean, I'm, I agree absolutely um, in most of what you say, Kate. And I wonder though, what it could even mean at this point. And, and, I, and I'm not being like sarcastic. I'm just, I'm like, um, for the US to have a foreign policy that is not based on monopoly control of most of the world's fossil fuel supplies. I mean, that has been like the one guiding, um, you know, guiding light of American foreign policy um, for really the last century. Um, and it's what American hegemony has, has been sitting on. Um, and I don't, like, I don't know if, if there, you know, within the American foreign policy world, if there are people that are beginning to grapple with that. And I, I guess I'd throw that question out to you. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if I have a good answer. I mean, the, the, yeah, there, there, there's a sort of irony in this, right? Because I think, you know, American dominance on the world stage has very much been subsidized um, by cheap oil, but we don't actually have monopoly control over fossil fuels, right? Some 65% of the world's reserves are under state ownership. 
Um, and you know, much of that within OPEC countries and, and elsewhere. That, that was sort of the thing I was trying to grapple with in the in the piece. You know, I've I've written uh, in favor of national nationalism in the U.S. fossil fuel industry, which I stand by. Um, but it's such a weird, exceptional thing um, to have that entirely under uh, private control, right? Like the U.S. fossil fuel sector is this very strange beast. Um, you know, other countries like Norway, right, have these big sovereign wealth funds that they. Um, you know, used to, to make investments in other things or still, you know, a petrol state in some, in some sense. Um, but I think it's a much um, bigger question to think about, you know, what this transition looks like. I mean, like I, like I said before, right, we, we fight all these battles in the U.S. about um, what happens to West Virginia, what happens to Texas, what happens to Alaska. It pales in comparison to what, I mean, look at, you know, I think the example of Venezuela just is, is, is mistakenly cited as a failure of socialism. Um, you know, there are big problems with, with Maduro and the Chavez rule and whatever, um, but it's a petro state, right? That, that, you know, put all its eggs in the same basket of this, this inherently volatile um, fuel source. And that is, you know, in many ways, a preview for um, the types of things that will come to other countries, you know, that rely, you know, their public budgets rely inordinately on, on fossil fuels and, and have huge debt burdens. Um, that are, are such a big, um, you know, have been such a structuring principle of, of the global order for the last 40 years, right? Is to, you know, just load up countries with that. Um, and the U.S. has played a big role in sort of helping structure that system. Uh, and I don't know, honestly, if, if, if there is, you know, a real appetite in the foreign policy community here um, to do that. I think, you know, if as, as much as attitudes, I think, have changed on climate and as much as there is a real sort of like, energy and, and in some ways sort of intellectual curiosity about how to take on this challenge in a big way, the foreign policy establishment is a tougher nut to crack by virtue of America being an empire, right? It's like that is, you know, a very sort of fixed element of, of, our, of our politics that is just so much harder to get at, I think, than, than almost anything else. And, and it's being ignored, I think, in a lot of sort of even progressive conversations about, about climate policy. Um, and, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know what to do about that, um, uh, truly, but I think it is a big question for, you know, a lot of the things um, we've been, we've been talking about today that we don't in the US have a great track record of doing big things without an enemy, without a, a, a foreign enemy, uh, in particular. Um, and I think that's a real challenge, right? I mean, I think you can look at like the Great society programs. You can look at the New Deal in, in, in some sense as you know a response to different sorts of foreign threats. And I think there's an attempt right now, um, you know, among not just Republicans in Congress, among you know there are Democrats who are pushing this thing called the Endless Frontiers Act, which says that the only way we can invest in R and D and invest in our country is if we are doing so to like explicitly like go to you know battle with China, um, which is. Sort of horrifying, right? We can do those things. Those things are actually quite popular. It's really called the yeah. Endless Frontiers Project. Yes, it, it's the Endless Frontiers Act. Um, wow. Just sort of incredible. Uh, Does Greg Grandin know about this? Yeah, yeah, he, he tweeted about it. Just pathos, really, sort of on, on full display. Um, but I think that's a big, a big challenge, right? And I don't think, um, you know, I don't think we're going to win, win the climate crisis if, if that's, you know, the sort of terms we can. We can think about by you know picking an enemy and just sort of like mobilizing our best selves in, in support of that. That has, not, that has not been sort of a sustainable model that we've seen, and I think that's a big challenge. Is how do we do all of the sort of massive work we need to do without you know pinpointing some global threat um, that we need to take on? The threat is is the climate crisis. I mean, the threat is the fossil fuel industry, right? Um, that that we need to take on, and that's a different type of conflict, right, than, than we've ever really. And the U.S. has, has, has as a government, been um, comfortable taking on historically. And I think that's the big, the big open question for me. We're almost running out of time. I want to see if we can squeeze in one relatively quick, concrete question to you guys, because it gets at a question that a couple different viewers um, asked about in terms of how to how to incorporate climate change into the way that countries do their accounting and do their kind of value processing, whether that means their GDP P or something else. Um, but what do you think about paying um, paying company paying countries to keep it in the ground or to preserve their forests and so forth? The opposite of this is obviously what do you think about a carbon tax, um, which are two different mechanisms for um, incorporating climate change into the monetary value of different kinds of products. Um, and I mean, this, this we could we could have a whole other hour about this, but I'm just getting a general sense of like 
pros cons um, with with our panelists right now. I mean, I, I don't think uh, international climate justice um, on any scale it will be in the slightest bit meaningful, or that there can be any kind of internationalist approach to this, you know, global problem without the wealthiest countries, which are the ones that have benefited the most from industrialization and produced the most emissions by huge amounts, um, giving money um, to poorer countries um, that have suffered the most um, and, and, you know, contributed almost nothing to this problem. I, I think it's, um, it's a, it's a question of justice and it's also a, a, a pragmatic question in terms of uh, um, dealing with a, a common problem on a um, common basis. There, there's simply no getting people on board um, if countries like the US and, and, uh, and Western Europe um, do not do their, their share. I agree with that, but we all, it, well, period. <laughs> Um, but it's also incredible that we have a taxation system that currently actually rewards, you know, pollution. We, we are currently taxing labor more than we tax materials. Um, we have a GDP measure, which actually increases when we pollute, you know, because someone has to clean it up. So we confuse price with value. Um, and, and that should also remind us that it's not just about getting the right prices, <laughs> Um, but also to really rethink our underlying systems of value and what we value, you know, again, coming back even to the COVID pandemic, we use words like essential workers, but we don't really value them similarly. And this has been talked about for years by environmental economists that we are not valuing, um, you know, sustainability and any of the sort of metrics we have. And, but what's amazing is that something as easy as getting the taxation system, right? <laughs> it's, 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 it's much harder in some ways to make sure we, um, actually, it's not that hard. We can definitely do the GDP thing as well. But anyway, they're really, you know, the, the saying where there's a will, there's a way. There just hasn't been the will. <laughs> it's not rocket science, you know, to be rewarding long-termism over short-termism. We still are paying, you know, we're rewarding uh, all sorts of actors that just move around existing assets in that kind of rent-seeking way that Kate was talking about in the beginning. Um, and that would be, you know, not impossible to change with the financial transaction tax, but also in terms of the direction of the investments we want, green investments, that's not impossible through a well-designed taxation system, but that wouldn't be enough. But until we actually see movement on these things that are so much easier, I think we have to call out the fact that there just hasn't been, you know, we're just not only not moving fast enough, we're not moving. <laughs> Yeah, I would just, I mean, I would just agree with what's been said so far, but just I think widespread debt relief is a, is a prerequisite to dealing with this problem in any sort of honest way. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, like the US can have a massive role in that, right? We have, for very unequal reasons, a huge say in the IMF and World Bank and can um, just go a long way in, in, in really throwing, throwing our weight around whether, whether there, you know, are people at the State Department interested in that, I think is a, a different question, unfortunately. I want to close with, um, there's a question that was actually the first one that was asked um, by that viewer submitted, which was, um, you know, how to, how to basically how to cope amid sort of the doom and gloom. And I want to put a twist on that question because we're running out of time and um, ask you guys a probably unhelpful binary, which is, uh, do you think we're screwed or do you think there's hope? And um, obviously this, breaks into a much bigger discussion. But I think that sometimes it's easy for us to come across as saying, you know, no, we're absolutely screwed. And then people come away saying like, all right, I mean, I'll go to a rave. And you know, that's that's my answer to the climate crisis, right? Um, yeah, screwed or hope? Hope. <laughs> uh, again, look at the places that are doing it much, much better. We talked about Vietnam and Kerala. By definition, that has to give hope. There's ways to do things better. <laughs> the problem is, you know, making that happen. But doom would would be there's no solution. Everything sucks. There's no uh, agency in the system. There is agency. We need to have accountability and and change happen. With, um, you know, you you don't nudge this along. <laughs> you make it happen. Yeah, I, I would in in that binary choice, I would I would choose hope. But you know, we'll quote Gramsci, you know, pessimism of, of, of the of the intellect, optimism of the will. 
um, which is that, you know, I think we're on track for things to get much for the, for the, you know, weather to look a lot different than it has for most of our lifetimes. Um, but I don't think that means life has to be worse, right? Like the planet will change, weather will change, you know, things will look a lot different than they have, but there's no um, reason why that, that has to be um, a worse situation than we're in now, which is bad for, you know, other reasons besides the climate crisis. Um, you know, and I hope, I hope people do go to raves, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a big part of the, my, my hope for the, you know, climate, climate change future more. Right, I appreciate so cool. that I gave you a crude binary and you responded by quoting Gramsci. That's uh, <laughs> Ben. You want to you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I don't know if there has to be the binary. Uh, you know, I, I mean, like things are, are shitty and things have been shitty for a long time, and people have struggled in impossible situations. Um, you know, for many, 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 many millennia. Um, and people have lived and people have found things to value about life. Um, people have, have found the world we live in um, and one another um, impossibly beautiful and worth fighting for, um, no matter how difficult the, the circumstances. Um, life is strong. Um, I'm not sure we could have orchestrated a better note to end on, but that really was improvised, folks. Um, um, uh, in any event, uh, we could keep going for ages, which is why we have an entire vertical devoted to this topic. Um, I will paste it into the chat. Uh, we also have at this vertical currently all three panelists' pieces up on the site. And again, don't forget to buy their books also. The art's really nice in this issue. We were discussing it right before you all got here. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty. Can't find it right now, but it's pretty. So. Take a look. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for participating in this and also for your just spectacular features in the magazine. They were so thought provoking. Um, and uh, thanks to our viewers for joining us.